Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Sue Varos, and I'm the Director of Enrollment Management for the University of Queensland Ashner Clinical School. And today's webinar topic is six months a resident. So I will start off by introducing our uh, guest today. And besides myself, we have Brian Mallon, my colleague in Australia. He's the Marketing and Communications Manager. And we have three residents, Dr. Sarah Vitug, Humit Desai, and Elmor El Mastri. So I'm going to start off our webinar with a brief overview of our program. And I will share my screen, screen and go through a few PowerPoint slides. Just a second. Okay. Okay, so as I love this depiction because it shows where we are in the world in New Orleans at the Ashner Clinical School and then in Brisbane and uh, at the University of Queensland in Australia. Okay. And here are our players for today in the webinar. I'm Sue and then we have our three residents participating as well who you'll get to meet very shortly. Okay, so I wanted to point out that this is a unique partnership between two powerhouses that exist in the world. The University of Queensland is actually ranked by US News and World Report in the top 40 global universities. They're actually ranked at number 36. And I think that speaks well to their prestige and uh, the excellence that they have in their programs and their school overall to be a global university of that high ranking. Then Ashner Health System, located in New Orleans, is growing throughout the whole Gulf South, and there's even locations throughout the US. It's a, it's a huge training facility. It's excellent for our residents training program and our medical students when they do their clinical rotations. So they're growing, they're innovative and very impressive. So this is a joint program between these two powerhouses, which leads to the excellence of the overall program. So it's four years of study. Our match rate is very good. Last year was overall 95.4% match. You are eligible to take the ECFMG which enables you to practice medicine on both continents. And we have student uh, residents throughout all of US and you can qualify to either practice in the US or on Aust in Australia. I want to point out that we have research opportunities which are really unique. You can uh, piggyback your MD degree with one of these. And I know we have uh, Sarah, Sarah Vito, our uh, physician who is also taken advantage of the master's uh, philosophy. And uh, you will be hearing more from her about that today as well. Here are some of our requirements. We do have an MCAT requirement of 5.0 minimum. For GPA, we require a B average. And we will have some uh, prerequisites, which are, I'll show you on our next slide. But that's our only prerequisite. So it is different than applying through AMCAS. You don't have to have the 10 prerequisites with organic chemistry and biology, all of that. It's only two prerequisites, which I'll show you shortly. And then uh, we have a free online application as well with no secondary application required. Once you qualify for or meet these uh, minimums, you're ranked and possibly into invited for an interview, a multiple mini interview. So we don't require that you submit a personal statement or letters of recommendation. This is actually how we find those soft skills that you have is through our multiple mini interview. Here's our prerequisites. We require that you now have integrative cell and tissue biology and a systems physiology course. We find that students who have these courses tend to do well in their program. What we'd ask you to do is find your syllabus 
or your course description and submit that to us so we can review and see if that qualifies and fulfills the requirement. This is some cohort demographics. Uh, as you can see, male, female is split. Our average age is 25, average MCAT 508. And here's our average GPA for masters holder, those that hold the masters and those that hold bachelor's degree. So I would like that you join our mailing list and you can do that two ways by clicking on that link for engage UQ, edu at AU, Oshkram, MD, or you can send your information. To join our mailing list, we need your first and last name, your email address, phone number, home state, and the year that you intend to start the program. And here are our residents. And I'm going to stop sharing our screen and we'll be hearing from them shortly. I have a few questions to ask. And our chat room is open. So you can start submitting your questions that you have for our residents. Now keep in mind, they've only been on their job in their internships and residency for six months now. So I'm sure they're very busy and I'll stop sharing my screen and we will hear from them shortly. So hello, welcome, welcome physicians. Thank you for joining us. And I'd like to start off by introducing, having each of you introduced yourself possibly can tell us your hometown and where you're going, where did you go for undergraduate and where you are for your residency and your specialty. So um, Dr. Vitug, would you like to start? Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming on to this chat. We really do appreciate it. Hopefully you find this informative and we'll do our best to stay awake and give you as much insight as possible. So I'm originally from San Diego, California. I went to UC Santa Barbara for undergrad and a brief master's at LMU. And then obviously I'm here in Los Angeles at Harbor UCLA doing my general surgery prelim year. And then I'll be at UC San Diego next year for my anesthesia residency. Thank you so much. And Dr. El Mastery. Hi everyone, <clears throat> my name is Omar and uh, I was actually born and raised in Lebanon. To, uh, I say there's low as 18, but then I moved to Southern California as well, best place, and went to UCLA for undergrad. I did a master's at LMU as well, not knowing Sarah back then, and uh, went to UQ Oshner for med school. And I'm doing my intern year right now uh, at Oshner and uh, I'm doing anesthesia for a specialty, but for my prelim intern year is mostly internal medicine. Excellent, thank you. And Dr. Desai. Hello everyone, my name is Boomin Desai. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not from California. I'm actually a uh, local from Baton Rouge. Um, went to LSU for my undergrad and then uh, I'm doing my orthopedic surgery residency here at Oshner in New Orleans. Thank you. Well, I'd like to talk about how did you find the transition from medical school to your residency and your internship. So first, can you explain the difference between internship and residency in case any of our viewers are not sure how they relate? And uh, Dr. Desai, we'll start with you. Um, sure, so I guess for me, it's a little bit different. Orthopedics is a five-year program. Um, so our intern year, while we do six months of general surgery and six months of orthopedics, it's all integrated within the five-year program. Um, Omar and Sarah can actually probably talk a little bit better about the difference between their internship, which is in medicine before they go, or surgery, before they go into, you know, their field. Uh, I don't know, Omar, you want to chime in? Sure. So, I mean, everybody has to do an intern year. That's like your first year of residency, but like Boomit said, either it's integrated or uh, you just do it on your own. It's something different than your specialty. And for some of the highly specialized specialty, anesthesia being one of them, I think there's radiology, neurology, dermatology, and 
a few other ones, you have to do a, a year in something outside of your specialty, basically. So you can do either uh, surgery like Sarah is doing, or you can do internal medicine or there's transitional and there's other things. But I think 80% of anesthesia programs, I don't know about other specialties, but for anesthesia programs, 80% are integrated, meaning you do what I'm doing, which is uh, you do your intern year at the institution that you're going to be at. So I'm doing my intern year at Oshner, and then I'll just continue years two through four there as well. And the other 20 or so percent are, uh, uh, they're not integrated, they are advanced, meaning you do your anesthesia years at a specific place, and then you have to, you know, secure a prelim year, either in surgery or internal medicine somewhere else. But both are like good options and you I'm sure Sarah and I are both enjoying our experiences in different ways. Hey, how did you find your transition from being a medical student to starting this, your uh, internship and residency? Was that full on uh, difficult or was it a smooth transition? Talk a little bit about the change that you experienced from you're entering the work world now. You're not just a student anymore. Uh, for me, so I think the biggest difference is that there's accountability and responsibility now. You know, as a medical student, you're there to learn. You're given times to show up. You're in a you know constrained environment. You know, what you learn and how hard you work is completely up to you. But at the end of the day, you have a structure. Um, <clears throat> in residency, it's a whole new ball game. You're doing a lot of the same things, but now you're responsible for patients. Um, you have upper levels. You're part of a team. You know, you have attendings that you work with who expect certain, you know, standards. Um, so dealing with that in, in the midst of also learning the hospital system, you know, not just notes and, and Epic, which is what we use, but rather like working with different consulting services and how to work with different teams and different specialties. So um, big learning curve, you know, it's, it's a lot more than just medicine, um, but it's, it's been good so far. Yeah, and I can add on to that. And, you know, as a medical student, we have a lot of, you know, hard and fast deadlines, for instance, if we have an exam to study for, if we have, you know, an assignment due. And as an intern, you know, we kind of have to make our own type of schedule that we need to adhere to, to be as productive and as efficient as possible. No one is holding our hands through this process. And sometimes our responsibilities aren't very explicit you know, we have to figure them out as we go. We have to bounce ideas off our co-interns and our residents. So a lot of residency is a very fluid process. You kind of just have to think on your feet and ask nurses and your ancillary staff. And, you know, there's a lot of people out here to help you, but you can really find direction if you look for it. Otherwise it's not going to be laid out for you and structured as much as, you know, med school was. Yeah. I think for me, like it was, uh, I started my intern year on the medical ICU. So it's a bit of a scary place to be in, especially after I had just finished med school. And, you know, I would say my opinions, but I wasn't really like taking care of really sick patients. And they're actually like my patients. There was a lot of oversight, obviously, from upper levels and uh, fellows and attendings and all of that. But it was a big learning curve, I think. And I think it was uh, like, for instance, if they ask you like, you know, this is wrong with the patient, what would you do? I would like, as a med student, I would say like, for example, use some blood pressure medicine and like everybody would be like, oh my God, you're so smart, right? But then they're like, well, which one do you want to order? And then like, what dose do you want to start them at? And how often do you want to give it to them? And then you go to put it in the computer and you write like the name of, you know, say, I don't know, like I'm Lodipine, 17 things come up and you're like, which one do I order? I don't know, this one, that one, how often, which dose should I start? Like, it's just a lot of learning, but it happens quite fast. And now that I'm six months in, like that feels like a million years ago when that was the situation. So I really do think I've learned, like I've learned so much in med school and it was a very informative and a really great base to start residency with. But I also feel like I've learned so much more in the past six months, probably I would say more than I've learned all throughout four, the four year of med schools. Very good. Can you tell me how did you feel when you were entering, coming off of your, uh, re your rotations through Oshner, did you feel prepared to enter this? Talk a little bit about, about that. How did, you, did you feel confident in your training at Oshner to go into your residency programs? Yeah, you know, I did actually feel prepared in terms of 
taking a thorough history and performing a physical exam, but you know, we did, or I felt a little rusty, you know, coming off the or six month break, you know, we haven't done any clinical rotations and then getting thrown into intern year was a little bit of, you know, an uphill climb, but, you know, we pick it up real easily. And, you know, I think having studied for the step three exam, you know, just to sharpen up prior to intern year was actually a really good move just because some of our clinical knowledge was, you know, one more pass through before we actually give this real job, you know, a go. And so I felt like our really strong history and exam skills from, you know, all throughout years one through four of UQ Oshner really teed us up well. And then all our studying, you know, in that six month leading up to actually starting into me or turned, you know, put me into a really nice position to hit the ground running. I think for me, yeah, like I, I mean, I second Sarah, I thought we had great training. I think we worked under, amazing attendings and residents and fellows and different specialties. So I felt ready. I had, Boomit and I probably had a little bit of an advantage in that we actually stayed in the system. And it was like really nice to go on the first day and see Dr. Jane, who like I had worked with in the IC before. And she was like, hey, Omar, like, you know, like I was like, okay, I'm not so scared. And, uh, but I definitely felt like, yeah, like Sarah said, studying for step, I also, I studied for step three during the break. And I thought that that was good and helpful to keep some, uh, medicine facts like uh, fresh in our mind and I definitely think that you know like the clinical skills that I've learned and just like my interaction with patients and how to be sympath like empathetic and you know basically like help them with their fears and whatnot also came in handy like a lot which is something that you don't learn as much in for, for, I mean you do actually learn it a lot in UQ because there's a big focus on that from early on but you definitely hone it down a lot more in third and fourth year at Oshner. And, and certainly being in Australia for the first two years and being in that hospital system, you get to see how that's different. But once you get back to New Orleans, I mean, Oshner is, you know, the largest healthcare system in Louisiana uh, with so many residency programs. Now there's a medical school. The faculty are more than well equipped to teach. And a lot of, we have some really great faculty. So from a teaching standpoint, I don't think there's anything different from our rotations as, you know, US MDs when it comes to years three and four. Um, and that's in the quality of teaching and also probably in the exposure that we get. Uh, you know, we go to different hospitals around the city, um, whether it's internal medicine, different surgery specialties or OBGYN, you know, whatever it may be. Well, Dr. Desai, it leads me to my next question. Since you're now in your residency and working with other residents from all over the U.S. that have entered the match and also wound up in your same location, can you tell any difference between your training and others training? How do you compare with your colleagues? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I feel any different or there's some lack in the education that we received compared to anyone else. I mean, everyone comes in day one of residency as a, a bright eyed, bushy tailed intern, you know, and, uh, yeah, it, the work that you put in from day one and, and your background in medicine will obviously help you, but um, there's no disadvantage or, or you know, differences coming out of our program compared to other residents. I think I, I like skills wise and educational wise, I totally agree. One thing that I've noticed, and maybe this is just like my bias, but I felt like our, uh, like our classmates and people that we trained with are a bit more like you know, we, we want to work hard, we want to learn, but they were more fun to be around. They were like, had other aspects that were a lot more interesting about their personalities and like to have fun and do other things. And that's not to say that some of my co-residents and interns that trained elsewhere didn't have that, but I felt like our class, maybe it's my class specifically, but like in general, the UQ Washington cohort had a bit more interesting personalities than some of the other people. But like on a training wise, I felt equally trained as anybody else. I didn't feel like I was behind or, or that far, you know, ahead of people. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one question I'm curious about is that you started your residency during the pandemic. How did that affect your, um, your daily life and your training? Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been hectic for a lot of us, I think I can talk for like us at Oshner and 
Louisiana's numbers are high, but they're not as high as like California right now. So maybe like Sarah has a different perspective, but even here, like the hospital is swamped. The hospital is at double capacity as what it would usually be at this point. And the problem is there's not a lot of uh, decreased demand for outpatient stuff, which is what happened like in March. So people came in to help us. So we have less to help. So we're being, a lot of things have changed, meaning like we are, overseeing a lot more patients than we usually do. So that is exhausting. And hour wise, it's getting tiring. Like I, I'm on a consult service that was a consult service that became primary now with cardiology with like 15 to 18 patients with one day off a week versus like, usually we would have had like more, uh, like more days off and like less, and that's considered used to be considered like a chiller rotation after like leaving ICU. And uh, we're being like flexed into ICUs to help more. So I think, uh, in a way, like you're getting more training, but also in a way, and I don't know that this is unique to like our program. This is everybody who's going through training right now. We're kind of getting shafted a little bit because we are doing a lot of COVID management that we're not getting to see as much of the other stuff that we usually would have like a bit more time maybe to slow down and focus on and learn from. But I don't know that that's unique to like our program. That's probably everybody in training right now. Yeah, and just, to build off that, being in Los Angeles, having been you know one of the hardest hit um, counties in the U.S., a lot of our care has been shifted towards you know a crisis standard of care. And you know, as a physician entering this workforce at this time, it's almost all we know. So from hearing from our upper levels, you know, we have to limit resources and you know choose between who gets what and. You know, I hope that this is a way that we'll just continue to put behind us, you know, once we're beyond the pandemic. But what we see now in medicine is having to choose between who gets what care. And I know that weighs on us emotionally because we know everyone is should be entitled to the utmost care. And working in the ICU right now is very hard because a lot of my job is actually talking to families and giving updates. And I know that entering residency, I didn't see that as one of my you know, daily things to do. And I know that being a general surgery you know, resident this year is a lot different than what other people had envisioned as their first year in general surgery, because you know, we're not going to the OR for any of the elective cases. Those are completely out of the you know, question. We're being shunted towards covering our ICU, like medical ICU teams. Now it's now, you know, medicine and then anesthesia is brought in and then general surgery residents are now asked to cover specifically COVID patients. You know, we're dedicated prone teams every four hours, you know, out of our um, day to just go and prone certain patients. So it's a huge change. And that's, you know, not even to mention that we don't see our colleagues really without masks. And that's like a whole nother thing, but you know, we're all learning as much as we can, whether it's like ventilators or, you know, even just breaking bad news, there's always something to learn amidst this pandemic. Okay, um, well, let's look at the chat room. We do have a few questions that have come in. And our first one is from um, someone who has a goal of reproductive endocrinology says that you are all in competitive residencies. How hard was it to place into that, especially as an international medical graduate? And what is your most important factors that made you stand out um, or road residencies common with UQ Ashner? I mean, you know, you have three examples right here of, of competitive specialties in, in different places around the country. Um, I mean, just from our class, like, you know, we had people matching neurosurgery and general surgery and um, other very competitive places, not only just specialties too. So I think it's 100% dependent on how hard you work and your step one scores have a lot to do with it. Uh, so the opportunities are there, you know, there's great mentorship along the way. There's, um, at Ashram in particular, there's a lot of faculty who are keyed in and have connections across the country um, who can get you in touch with, you know, program directors and set you up for success. So if, you know, rep and that is your field that you want to do, I mean, that those opportunities are available to you, uh, in my opinion. 
I also think we have a growing network of people matching into a lot of places. And, you know, oftentimes we're pretty hardworking and people who are not familiar with our program were like, I think our, my class was the sub, our class, us three was the seventh class to graduate. And, uh, you know, like we're placing in really great places and that opens doors. And I know like for reproductive endocrinology, I think most people do it through like either like urology, if you're interested in male side, or you can do it from uh, OBGYN from the female side. And one of my roommates last year matched at University of Hawaii, which is like the only OBGYN program in the state. And she had like really great interviews elsewhere. So when I think she had, I think the question might've said something about SoCal. So yeah, she had interviews there. And so the, the options are there. And like Boomit said, I think there's a lot of hard work from our end, whether that's uh, studying and like being really good on your rotations and applying yourself. And I think, yeah, we have a good network and a system that works to place us well as well. Thank you. Yeah, and just to build on that, you know, matching into a Southern California program also um, was difficult, but you know, you have to start as early as you can in terms of building that network if you have, you know, any mentors throughout undergrad or med school that you can reach out to to start coordinating a sub internship, which is essentially an audition rotation at some point in your fourth year if those are allowed, you know, given the circumstances. I highly advise that you try and organize those as soon as possible, even if it sounds like you're a little eager or, you know, if you're starting early, just put it on people's radar that that is your goal and that you're willing to, you know, do whatever it takes to make those connections and to, you know, really show that you're interested and in whether it's a research project or an actual audition rotation just don't be afraid to, you know, reach out early and capitalize on whatever connections you do have. Thank you. There's actually two questions asking each of you, do you think you would consider practicing medicine in Australia or are you staying in the US? What are, what are your intentions? I've definitely considered it. I don't, uh, I did not want to do my training there just because I did not want to close the door on uh, practicing in the United States. So I felt, and there are some like, uh, you know, some things that you have to do to, if you wanted to do your training here and then go to Australia, but it's a lot less rigid than the other way around. I don't think I've personally like actively like considered it just because like Australia is really far and a lot of my family lives between the US and Europe. So, I, but I'd be open to it. Yeah, I mean, Australia was awesome. I really enjoyed my time there, but um, I mean, all my family and everything is here, so I can't see myself, you know, leaving America. And, okay, so uh, our next question, I'm sorry, let me get that, is um, how, do you, how do things change with the pass fail of step one? Will more emphasis be placed on step two? I would imagine. I, I mean, I'm not too yeah. sure, but yeah, mm -hmm. probably. I agree. I don't think that there's going to be, you know, much of a differentiation unless there is a quantitative score. But, you know, you just have to give it your all every step of the way, whether it's, you know, quantitative or not. You really do just have to go for it. Okay. Well, how many residency programs did you apply to for all panelists? And why did you select Ashner over other programs? Ashner for school. So I think the number of programs that you that this average applied to differs very widely by specialty. Um, last year for orthopedic surgery, the average applicant was applying anywhere between 80 to 90 programs. So I was somewhere in that ballpark. Um, with the more competitive specialties, you'll see that um, people often throw a wide net um, and that's the growing trend. And so every year now, I think the common theme in orthopedic is, has become applied to every program in the country, if you can. Um, so it, it, I think it just it varies by uh, the specialty. And then why Oshner? So as a third and fourth year med student, I spent a lot of time with the orthopedics team here. So the biggest thing for me was fit. And I wanted to be close to my family in Baton Rouge, which is just an hour and a half away. So uh, I came down to fit for me. 
Yeah. And for me, I, you know, casted a wide net as well. I applied to, you know, almost a hundred programs that were specifically anesthesia. And then with some of my, you know, programs that I was interested in were advanced programs, meaning you start as a second year resident. So you have to apply to a handful of preliminary programs as well. And so, you know, there's always a factor of how much money do I want to spend on this process? And you really have to just, you know, think about how, like, can I get, can I get the number of interviews that I think I can get with this number that I apply to? So it boils down to strategy in the long run, but, you know, I know this past year was a little different, obviously, with not having to travel anywhere, but when we were all applying, you know, it was just how much can I feed into this process and what are my chances with this number of programs, but, you know, go big or go home, you have to apply to as much as possible. It boils down to a numbers game. Yeah, I think I probably applied in like 80, like mid, mid 80s somewhere, I think for programs. I think I agree with Sarah and Boomit. Like it depends on your specialty and it depends on your preference. Like do you want to be in a particular geographic location? The thing is with residency, and I think like you, you're going to be a bit older by the time that decision happens and people make decisions for different reasons. So yeah, you might even be have a really good shot of going to an amazing program, but you don't want to be in like the East Coast or you want to be close to family or you're, I don't know, settling down or whatever. So there's a, a lot of factors that go into that. But I, per, for me, my personal journey was... Uh, I really didn't want to go anywhere cold. So that excluded like most of the Midwest and like East Coast. Like I don't care how procedures they were, not interested. And then I didn't want to go like deeper in the South than New Orleans because I personally love New Orleans and had a great time here. And I, the anesthesia department at Oshner, I think is phenomenal and I'm probably biased, but yeah, like I had a, I thought I was also a good fit for, for the program here, like Fumit said. And so I was like, I either want to be in Southern California back home because I think that's where I want to end up eventually or I would rather stay in New Orleans to do my training. So that was my rationale for uh, staying. And I thought I would have an amazing training at Oshner because you look at their fellowship matches for anesthesia specifically and where they place people. And that's something that uh, is an important factor when you do decide and they have great matches for fellowship and I'm going to have great training and I'm in a city that I love. And so that was the main factor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vitag, specifically for you, um, what and where rotations did you do in California to match there? Yeah, so I rotated at USC and I did my ICU rotation there, which, you know, because I'm doing anesthesia, it was a really good exposure to doing critical care and anesthesiology since their ICU department is actually headed by anesthesiologists. So it was great exposure. I built that connection. And, you know, while I was there, I was lucky enough to have jumped on a couple of research projects too, which, you know, lasted beyond that physical rotation. So if you're ever um, presented with the opportunity to do a sub internship, always put it out there. Hey, while I'm here, are there any available research projects that I could potentially like offer a hand in? Because that allows you to extend your contribution to this institution beyond that physical rotation. And so if you're lucky enough to get published, things like that, you know, that is very good evidence for your output while at that rotation. And, you know, you're going to be um, listing these things on your CV. And when it comes to interviews, you have it down on paper. Hey, I rotated here as a sub I and I produce this research. So, you know, it's a, killing two birds to one stone. And I can really only just attest to trying to get your hand into as many research projects as possible. It's very good advice. Uh, Kate, do each of you mind talking about how supported you felt by the program, both in Australia and in the U.S., throughout medical school and into the matching process? I felt very supported, I think, for the most part. Uh, like, so that's something, I think, I don't know if it's a theme that you've heard so far, but you know, no one's going to hold your hand. There's going to be a lot of support for you in phase one. So back in Australia and here through the application process, and you're going to get all the information you need and people are going to advocate for you and uh, do their best to help you. But also I think a lot of the work falls down on you, but I, I felt very supported. I thought 
the admin I had a really good relationship with the administration administration. They knew a lot about me and what I needed and how they can help me and support me get there. My experience might have been a little bit different. I was on the student government for four years, so maybe they knew me really well for that reason. But I feel like a lot of my other friends also had similar opinions about the program. Yeah, for sure. Our uh, administrative staff at Ashner is phenomenal and uh, you get to know them very closely. Um, and it's especially in fourth year when you're going through residency applications because they coordinate all of your resume and paperwork, um, getting everything organized for you. Um, so, I mean, for orthopedics, I was the only person applying to that in my year. So in some ways, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. So, you know, there wasn't that support system from other students, but whenever I had a question, um, the administration was definitely helpful um, anytime I needed it. Okay, um, our next question is about life in Brisbane. So our group would like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and give us this information. But did you find that transition easy in Brisbane? And what were some of your favorite things about living there? Yeah, I know looking back, I always enjoyed um, just having a melting pot of friends. You know, there was a huge representation of Canadians and people from New Zealand. And that was just a phenomenal opportunity to meet people from all parts of the world. And when I felt as if, you know, we had just finished an exam, it was just a great opportunity to travel outside of Brisbane and seeing um, Sydney and Melbourne and going to, you know, New Zealand on a three day weekend. If you're someone who likes to just go out on a whim and see new places and study on the airplane, do things like that. You know, it's a great opportunity to both, you know, work hard, play hard. You'll get your work done and you'll find a way to travel. So that was my favorite part about being abroad and in Brisbane and having a ton of friends who are equally as, you know, adventurous and free spirited to do things like that in your free time. I thought it was great. Like just there's public transportation and you can go everywhere. The, you know, you're very close and you can travel while you're in Australia. Like, cause I, you know, a lot of us got to go to a bunch of places. And like I traveled a bunch in Southeast Asia and went to New Zealand and went to different parts of Australia, which I don't know how many, I mean, I actually, I do know my friends who went to US med schools did not have similar opportunities. So it was, really great in that way. And I mean, I got to meet fun people, like I said earlier, I think our people are funner than other places. Yeah, moving to Brisbane was relatively um, easy, you know, considering the fact that you're moving to the other side of the world, it's easy to assimilate. Like Omar said, the public transport is phenomenal. Uh, not having a car for two years was actually really nice. And uh, the people are nice, it's a very safe city. Um, and I know a lot of us lived in all over town, either it was on campus or on the other side of town, just whatever your personal preference was and it worked out really well. Do you think that most people got their first choice at residency? I don't know if they, if like, I don't know how many people got their number one choice, but the top three people who got like their top three, I think it was like 80 something percent or something like that if I'm not mistaken but it was a high number of people who got their top one of their top three choices so it was pretty high but I don't know how many got like specifically their number one choice I don't know if you guys have access to that data we do okay uh so Dr. Desai a question for you what sort of extracurricular activities would you recommend for someone that wants to go into orthopedics um, one of the things that I did that I thought was helpful was get involved in research. Um, I actually didn't do, I, I didn't have, I didn't focus on research as an extracurricular my first two years of med school, but I really got involved third year. Um, and then, you know, the, the, our Oshner program at that time was, there was just a lot of opportunities and I dove in head first and, uh, basically just took advantage of any opportunity that came about and that really helped not just in terms of putting things on my resume, but getting to make personal connections with people. I would say that that was actually a bigger advantage than any of, of the publications or abstracts or you know anything you can put on paper. 
Thank you. Our next question is about research as well. And I know that Dr. Big took, took advantage of the research opportunities to get the master's in philosophy. But uh, the question is what research, if any, were you all involved in and what else extracurricular as well? Yeah, so initially I had a interest in dermatology. And so one of my main reasons to have done the MPhil was because I was doing surgical oncology research prior to med school and having gotten accepted to UQ, I knew that my skin cancer research would have been a way to continue that at, you know, essentially the skin cancer capital of the world. And so it was just, you know, the theme of my life is just taking advantage of opportunities whenever they present. So luckily my um, Santa Monica John Wayne Cancer Institute had collaborations with the Sydney Melanoma Institute and I just connected the two and asked how I can further this project and that opened doors to you know finding a PI at UQ who could essentially guide me to you know expanding more on my interest in melanoma and I kind of just like followed it until I realized I didn't actually want to do dermatology you know I wanted to be in more of a surgical setting and although I'm not pursuing, you know, a career in dermatology, I know that an MPhil was 100% one thing that boosted me into my, you know, application process because having research to talk about is always something that I know people will, you know, want to know more about, if, especially if you're going to an academic institution. So for instance, when I was interviewing at UCSD, they designated one of the interview panelists as a straight PhD molecular biologist who just wanted to talk research. And so I felt like because I had you know, that in my tool shed, it was just something that I felt comfortable with. And I know that would have been um, and difficult for other applicants who didn't have research in their wheelhouse. So you know, I think if you have a research interest, just see it out until um, you don't want to do it anymore, but obviously understand that it's going to help you in the long run. Any other comments? I, I mean, I think we all got involved with research to a certain extent, and uh, I've worked on some projects. And I think, yeah, like Sarah said, like it, it just shows a level of like interest in the field and they want to see that you want to make the field better and to like advance obviously the field and the department at wherever institute you're interviewing at. I think there's other extracurriculars as well that you can do. So I think uh, like be true to who you are. And I think that shows on the interview. So like, if you're interested, like for me, I was interested in like, I used to be a high school teacher and I'm interested in like the education side of things. And that's why I was involved with the student government. And that's something that I think my CV and my application like really spoke to that a lot. And I think like leadership and stuff like that are important for me. So the people saw that and commented on that and on top. So there's other things if you like volunteering is your thing and giving back and like then do that, like, you know, on top of like, obviously still do research and all of those things, but speak like do whatever speaks to you and wherever you think you see yourself and going in that niche later on in your specialty. Okay, thank you. Um, so Dr. V took a few more questions about your rotation. Um, how did you obtain that rotation at USC? And you mentioned that you were involved with research while you were there, but how long did that last? Because maybe that was just a short amount of time. So how did you work research into a rotation? Yeah, so while I was on my anesthesia elective at Oshner, one of my mentors was Dr. Kovaleski, who is quite senior in anesthesia, and he actually did his anesthesia residency at USC. So it's always making conversation with who your mentors are in terms of where they trained and, you know, who do they know. And he was able to put me in contact with his uh, mentor, who is still an attending at USC, and, you know, he put in a good word for me. And we just like set up a time to discuss my interests in terms of research and what it means to me to uh, match into a residency in California. And I found a way to take a trip home to you know, San Diego. And then I drove up to LA to meet with this doctor in person. And it really is just getting FaceTime with people who can you know, help you to that next level. And so we talked about it, we coordinated um, a time to you know, look at the logistics of my schedule and yeah, he just took me under his wing uh, while I was there. I got to help out with 
really unique cases and research doesn't always have to be a full blown, you know, IRB protocol type study. It could just be a case report. It can be um, a lit review. And those are all things that count towards research. So while I was there, you know, the first half of the day was essentially being in the OR or in the ICU. The second half of the day was dedicated research, writing up an abstract, submitting it to a conference or, you know, reading and putting together a lit review. So just spending two weeks at USC for that ICU rotation, we were still able to pump out three or four, you know, case reports or abstracts. So it doesn't always have to be, you know, a huge commitment that's going to require, you know, five, six people to have this research experience. It's just how small can it be for it to be published? And that's what we went for. Well, you did answer part of the next question that it did help you, you felt with matching for your residency, but could you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of obtaining a MPhil while obtaining your MD? Yeah, so I know, first of all, switching my brain from a purely research brain because a lot of my MPhil was bench science. So I was legitimately pipetting. I was looking into, you know, genes, this RNA sequencing and that analysis was so far off from any type of like clinical um, framework. And so I felt like I was struggling um, in my years three and four of med school when I had to balance both finishing up my thesis for my MPhil while studying for the step exams. But, you know, it really taught me to prioritize each day, you know, where if I say, okay, this weekend is dedicating I'm dedicating it to doing just research and then throughout the week I'm going to be fully clinical so I found it extremely difficult but when I returned to UQ for year four it was you know right after step two and I gave myself three months exactly to finish up my thesis so it was just finding a schedule that I was comfortable with to trust that I will finish my task in this amount of time and then I can, you know, go back into, you know, my clinical schedule. So for me, I don't really like putting both types of work on top of each other. I like segmenting, you know, all right, this is my research time. This is my clinical time. I don't really like breaking up my day into four hours here, four hours there. I really want to just like finish one thing and put it behind me. Thank you. Makes sense. So uh, we mentioned student being involved with student government. So how does one get involved with student government? You run. There are positions that are on the student government and depending on what you're interested in. Boomit was on student government with me for a year or two. I think he did research. I did. I was the academic representative like the first three years and then ran for the president fourth year. And uh, you just like run, you put out a statement as to like what you see yourself doing and what like issues you want to address during your time. And then people vote for you. and. If you get the votes, then you can, you're, you're representing your class at the end of the day, so. Well, did anyone consider other international medical schools like Ross or St. George's? Why did you choose Ashner? I yeah, personally I, didn't. But. I, I applied to St. George. Um, and then what it came down to was being able to come back to New Orleans for rotations because I was, familiar with the Oshner system and I knew that if you're doing rotations at Oshner it was a I mean this is where my family and I like grew up going and to see our doctors so I knew it was a um, you know a good a good healthcare system to be a part of and I would get a good teaching experience there. Any other comments? Yeah, and I also I didn't apply to any other international medical school. I was going to do the straightforward allopathic residency route until I learned about the UQ Oshner program while doing a Princeton review class. And the fact that we started six months ahead of everyone else and it was an opportunity to travel, one that I didn't have you know, to study abroad during undergrad. Um, I just felt like that this was a way to kind of check all the boxes for me to travel and to study and to kind of do it all and being able to live in New Orleans, you know, on our way back was also another, you know, thing that I really wanted to experience. So for me, it checked the traveling box, the med school box, and I thought that that was the best fit as well. 
I agree with Sarah. Like I didn't consider even applying because for similar reasons. And I wanted the whole idea of experiencing a different healthcare system than the United States. And I have family in Australia and one thing, and this is not like talking down like uh, you med schools in the Caribbean, but I didn't want to go to a school that's set up for me. Like I wanted a school that existed in and of itself for like a hundred years and is ranked in the top like 40 or whatever internationally in a degree that's like, everybody knows about it. So that was my personal bias. And I'm sure there are amazing physicians that I have worked with at Austin and elsewhere that have went to Caribbean schools and did great. So this is not to talk about the quality of their training, but for me, that was one of my factors as well on top of what Sarah said. Okay. Well, our next question is about clinical experience. And I know that in your first two years, you do get early patient contact while in Australia. So the question is, is there any comparisons between working clinically in Australia and the US? I don't know that like when I mean, we've worked as med students there clinically, we haven't like worked like as residents or physicians or whatnot, I'm not sure that I've noticed like that much of a difference. I think there's a bit more focus there on like physical exam and like guidance, like, you know, like less examinations and costly things just from like a healthcare perspective kind of thing. But I mean, from a medical training, I think it's similar. I don't know that there's that much of a difference. Okay. Uh, and uh, Dr. Vitug, we actually have a lot of interest in your uh, research. So could you expand a little bit more on pursuing a, either a doctor of philosophy or the master's of philosophy while you're in uh, working on your medical degree? Sure, so essentially, while you do um, a higher degree by research, which is that umbrella term that is both MPhil and PhD, the MPhil is essentially your halfway point to a PhD. So you're always offered the opportunity to upgrade from your master's to a PhD. Um, I know a couple of my colleagues did and they were successful. However, you know, a PhD compressed into three years is extremely difficult. And I knew that I only wanted to do a master's degree because I felt like that would, would have been enough of an edge to go into you know, applying to um, some competitive residency. Um, I wanted to do dermatology at the time. So most people that I knew who uh, had matched into dermatology or who were already dermatologists really recommended doing some form of higher degree by research. Um, and I know that a lot of people go into research without getting a higher degree by it. And that's also extremely useful. But I felt that if I was doing all this work and doing all the research, I wanted to at least get some form of certification out of it. And I think that's just my personal preference. If I'm going the long haul, I want it to actually count towards a degree. And I know some people don't feel that way. It's just, you know, boils down to publications, but you know, it was great to have stayed an extra year in Australia because they took a year off where it was full and fill between years uh, two and three of medicine. And after that, I was then part-time MPhil, part-time MD in years three and four back in New Orleans. So it equates to two full years of research for the MPhil and then three and a half years for the PhD. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We did have a question about um, cost of the program and how it compares to other international medical schools and I'm not sure of all of medical schools costs, but our first year uh, tuition cost is about 67K. So you can take that to compare and see what, what you think about our, our costs. I think it's competitive, definitely. Um, okay, so we're getting near the end of our webinar, but we do have a, a last question. And I'd like each of you to talk about what advice you might have for someone starting a program or applying to, applying to UQ Ashner. Any advice for them? I think this is a great program for me personally. It was a good fit. I think you just have to be a hard worker and driven. And I think that probably is true of any med school program, not just our program. Uh, I think go in there and be passionate about what you do and show that and 
you know, don't think that there is one way like to succeed in this program or any program really work to your uh, strength. And then, you know, whatever weaknesses you think you have address them as well. And uh, I think as you can see, like we have great matches from our program into everywhere and every specialty almost. So that's really good and works in your favor. And I think it just, you're gonna meet great people. And so just, yeah, work hard while you're there. It's not just like all fun and games and nothing is gonna guarantee you a residency spot. It's all based on your hard work and, and devotion, but you're in a solid program to help you get there as well. Yeah, I'd say the same, uh, you know, strong endorsement. Um, you know, probably initially I, I would think of the, I used to think of the IMG as a black mark or something, but, you know, almost came to where it is a, a, a patch of pride almost because I knew I wanted to do orthopedics from day one and that was a very competitive specialty. So it's an uphill battle, but now that I've, I've gotten to this point, it's very rewarding to say that, you know, I did it, uh, had, a, had a lot of backing, a lot of good support, met a lot of good people along the way and also worked hard. So uh, it was a very, very, very rewarding journey. Yeah, and to build off of both what Omar and Boomit have already said, sometimes people see the IMG, you know, stamp and it makes you feel as if it will be an uphill battle. But really, I always found it as an opportunity to showcase our program and it speaks about your character, you know, in ways that you don't really see initially. It shows that you're adventurous and you're a risk taker. And, you know, the fact that you've had an opportunity to care for a diverse, you know, global population and having that, um, you know, under your belt moving into residency, it really does sets you, it sets you apart and makes you memorable. So as long as you can show that you went into this program with a real passion for you know diversity and travel, whatever your calling is to go abroad, to move across the world, you know, you have to make it fit into who you are. And so, you know, always remember your reasons for doing this. And I'm always happy to talk about being an international medical graduate and having landed, you know, a California residency program. You know, not many people can say that. So it definitely will, you know, set you apart and I think in a really, really good light. Okay, well, that wraps up our webinar for today. So I would definitely like to thank our registered guests that have attended. Thank you for your interest in our program and for your fantastic questions. And for my colleagues across the world in Brisbane, Shallon Hilton Sinclair and Brian Mallon, thank you for managing the webinar and our chat box. And for our star panelists, Dr. Sarah Vigpeg, Omar El Masri and Bumat Desai. Thank you for joining us and I'm your host, Sue Ross, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.